Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Strategic Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Heather Conley. I direct our Europe, Russia, and Eurasia, Eurasia research here at the center. We are very excited to share with you an inaugural event, our annual high-level lecture on Russia's military capabilities. This is a part of a, a dialogue series uh, generously supported by US European Command's Russia Strategic Initiative. Our Russia Military Capabilities Working Group takes a deeper dive into Russia's evolving military capabilities. In fact, just two weeks ago, we had a deep dive into Russia's upcoming annual military exercise, Zapan. And so this is the type of programming that we are doing. Now, when you think of a high level lecture, you may think of one person standing behind a podium giving you a very long lecture. This is not the case. In fact, we've assembled what I consider a dream team of knowledge on space, of experts and former government officials who are going to help us understand Russia's evolving space capabilities and what they mean for Russia's uh, military capabilities. We are so fortunate here at CSIS to have such a wealth of knowledge uh, on space-based assets and issues. Our CSIS Aerospace Security Project led by Todd Harrison has done extensive work on this space. Uh, so we are marrying the, the, the functional knowledge we have now with this great uh, regional importance. So I'm sure many of you have been seeing some headlines about Russia's growing anti-satellite weapon capability. You may have seen some announcements about uh, China and Russia uh, planning a joint lunar station, an orbital, orbital space station in the future. And I'm sure you have some questions about what that means for US national security. So lots of questions, an enormous amount of expertise, Let's get started and let me first uh, introduce the first member of the dream team here, uh, who actually is going to give you a little lecture. We call this a mini lecture. It's just to give everyone uh, sort of a baseline of where we see Russia's uh, evolving capabilities. So it is my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Colonel Doug Lavero, president of Lavero Consulting. Previously, Doug served as former associate uh, administrator at NASA, and prior to that, he was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy from 2013 to 2017, someone who is steeped in this. So, Doug, no boring lectures because we're going we're gonna to keep this very dynamic, but we're so grateful for, to you for helping us set the table. And then after you're done, I'm going to introduce the rest of the dream team, and then we're going to get into a discussion. Doug, thank you so much. Over to you. Heather, thanks. Uh, thank you so much for having me for that great introduction. Actually, I, I'd rather just continue to listen to you speaking, Heather. It's so entertaining. <laughs> so... Um, but um, but as you said, yes, I'm going to give uh, just a very a very short um, and 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 you know it's hard to cover 60 years of R Russian and Soviet space history in five to ten minutes. But uh, but we'll give a quick view of it for the audience, and then I think we'll get into the more details as we go forward. Let me go ahead and share my screen for everybody, um, so you can see these uh, charts. Uh, there's only a few of them, so I'm not going to go ahead and hopefully death by, do death by PowerPoint for you. Um, but here we are um, as understanding uh, Russian space capabilities. And, um, and let me, let me uh, start off before I start the presentation to say, you know, a lot of what we see happening now in Russia is based upon the history of the Russian space program and how they got there. And so I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about that history. Uh, and then what I think we'll talk in our discussion about going forward. And the history of Russian space, actually, um, I want to start not in Russia, but I want to start in America. Uh, and this uh, paper, which is uh, sort of for those of us in the space business, um, it, is the, it is the father of all space documents, uh, commissioned by the Army Air Corps. They weren't the Air Force yet, but the Army Air Corps, uh, Major General, um, uh, Major, Major General, um, 
Um, excuse me, I can't now. I can't remember remember his name, but it's uh, um, the head of uh, Strategic Air Command uh, later. And General Caleb will help me because I've just drawn a blank on uh, on uh, the general's name. Um, but um, a general who later became the the head of um, the um, Strategic Air Command um, commissioned this when he was a major general um, to do an R and D project in 1946 before anybody had gone to orbit, before anybody knew you could get to orbit with the RAND Corporation on, could we build a world circling satellite? And RAND's conclusions were that we could, but their technical conclusions are less thoughtful than some of their conclusions about what the uses of some of these satellites would be. Um, and what they said in their report, and these are excerpts from it that I don't expect you to read all of, is that the military importance of space uh, will be establishing vehicles that are that arise largely from defenses against the, what was going on in the air domain at the time. They believed that we were not going to have permissive air domains in the future and we needed to move higher and faster. And so that became space. They connect in these discussions the connection of space and intercontinental ballistic missiles. They note that space can be used for observation um, with, with aircraft, and they use the word aircraft in this report, which cannot be shot down. And certainly, and in the, in, in the last paragraph here on this page says, and certainly the full military usefulness of this technique cannot be evaluated today. And that was an understatement because of course, they had no idea what we would eventually do in space. But another finding in the report, which I find really insightful is the following statement. And again, remember this was made in 1946. Um, the crystal ball is cloudy, but two things seem clear. A satellite vehicle with appropriate instrumentation can be expected to be one of the most potent scientific tools of the 20th century. And in fact, they were correct about that. But even more to the point, the achievement of a satellite craft by the United States would inflame the imagination of mankind and would probably produce repercussions in the world comparable to the explosions of the atomic bomb. And they were absolutely accurate in that statement, except for one thing. It wasn't the United States that launched that space, that first spacecraft, it was Russia. And in fact, it did inflame the imaginations and um, the repercussions that we're still feeling today. Now that brings us to what was happening in the Soviet Union. And I do not know if the Soviet Union had their version of the RAND report, but I wouldn't be surprised if they did. Um, but um, the Soviet Union very quickly um, as they entered the space age actually developed, started the first space force. You know, we had a debate in this country over the last several years about the development of a space force. Well, the Soviet Union created the Soviet space troops in 1955. Um, the Communist Central Party um, stood them up and they were led by a deputy min minister of defense for special weaponry, um, which was in basically in charge of all space. In the United States, we divided space into three sectors, really a civil sector, a military sector, and an intelligence sector. But in the Soviet Union, it was all placed under the military sector. And of course, famously, we all know that in 1957, two years later, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, but, th but several months before, two months before they launched Sputnik, um, they actually went ahead and launched their first successful ICBM. And it's the connection of these two pieces, ICBM to space launch, which really starts to go ahead and raise, um, raise worries and fears in the United States about losing the space race. And you can see the title of this chart talks about the early military space race because we've always spoken about the space race as if it was a race to get to the moon. But in reality, what was going on is there was a race for the military uses of space. And the Russians and the United States, to be fair, tried all sorts of things in terms of military space. Um, the first Russian anti-satellite weapon was tested in 1963. I should state, to be fair, the first U.S. anti-satellite weapon was tested in 1959. So it's not that we were doing things different or they were doing things different than us. Um, but obviously, our focus here is on the Russian side of things. And in fact, they actually had an operational um, uh, ASAT system uh, from the mid-70s um, up until 1993, until just after the Cold War ended. They created the Soviet military manned space station. Uh, which was called ALMAS in uh, the Soviet Union, but publicly for, per for propaganda purposes was called SALUT. Um, and that was actually fitted with a 23 millimeter rapid fire cannon, which they actually tested once in space. And they had developed this picture on that, that I have on the right of this slide, which really just came out of the classification uh, vaults within the last several months. 
uh, was a space launch, rocket launched grenade system that was supposed to be fitted um, to that manned space platform. And um, the Soviet Union even tested a fractional orbital bombardment system, which is a system intended to put nuclear weapons into orbit and then bring them down, um, have them re-enter many orbits later in order to avoid US missile uh, warning capabilities. And so there was a full-fledged military effort within the Soviet Union to go ahead and use space for both the kind of space systems that we think about today, observation, navigation, and those kind of things, but also for the, mili for the more militaristic weaponization aspects of space, which we have avoided since. And part of that avoiding since really becomes um, in the 70s and 80s, as we normalize space uh, within the Soviet Union. Uh, we signed the Outer Space Treaty in 1967, which while it does not outlaw weapons in space, certainly has a, has a sense that we want space to be a place where we can peacefully coexist with other nations and leverage each of those capabilities. Both the US and the Soviet Union deploy a full range of space services uh, during these decades. decades. The SALT treaties um, also limit what can be done both by placing nuclear by the ban on placing nuclear weapons uh, in space and create formal and informal agreements for how we will conduct conflict when space is involved formal agreements such as such as not interfering with national technical means and less formal agreements about you know if you destroy our nuclear warning satellites or nuclear c2 satellites we may view that as a prelude to nuclear war and so those agreements held us in pretty firm stead all during the 80s and the 90s without the need to continue to demonstrate the more militaristic weaponized aspects of space. And of course, in the 80s, the focus shifted mostly to missile defense systems in both nations. And we had those big debates in the US and in Russia about missile defense. But finally, um, you know, that all kind of came to an end at the end of the Cold War. And at the end of the Cold War, the Russian um, space effort was really uh, most, uh, sh mostly a shadow of what it had been uh, previously. Um, the spending declined um, and the capability declined. And a lot, of, a lot of work went towards commercializing some of the pieces of the Soviet space industry that was left, um, selling, uh, selling rockets and engines to the United States of America. In fact, that was part of our plan as well. Now, what happened though is in the 2000 and beyond timeframe, as the US began to demonstrate demonstrate all of the capabilities we could bring to bear by by marshalling space services to enhance um, terrestrial combat, um, we start to see a resurgent of interest in anti-satellite activities. Um, the DIA open source uh, literature basically show us a research program that covers the gamut of what we would expect in anti-satellite activities. I have some pictures here of specific things, um, SATCOM and GPS jammers, satellite communication and GPS jammers, which are well-known, operational, in incredibly capable, very powerful. Um, many of these within the Soviet Union uh, or the Russia or Russia now, excuse me, um, that, um, that are very capable of uh, denying uh, both those services. And we've seen that happen in exercises. We've seen that happen in, um, in activities against uh, some of their neighboring countries. Um, and so these, these are very, very capable weapons. And then we have weapons that are more or less in test. Um, I think everybody saw the announcement by General Raymond, the Chief of Space Operations uh, several months ago when he called out the Russians for the middle picture here, which was a co-orbital maneuvering vehicle that actually shot a projectile um, out in space after it had rendezvoused with a uh, national US satellite. It shot the projectile after it had left that vicinity, um, but nonetheless to demonstrate that they could have done that in the vicinity of the rocket. And then most recently, just in February of this year, uh, we had another Nudal test, a direct descent um, ASAT missile test um, from, uh, from Russia, which they have been uh, testing for many years. And so DIA um, has assessed that really Russian military doctrine here and, and, and all of their writings clearly articulate the sense that Russia, Russia clearly accepts the fact that space is a war fighting domain, which is not different than the um, same vernacular we use. And so we shouldn't be surprised at that. Um, but they view this as a decisive factor uh, in war as we do. Um, and certainly they are building the means um, as best we can tell to go ahead and make sure that they can eliminate um, U.S. space capabilities if war does occur. 
So where does that lead us going forward? Um, that's the that's really the big question uh, because Russia, while it is developing all these things, still has a hard time competing with the U.S. for for multiple reasons. And number one, their spending is still significantly less than it was. The recent Russian ten-year space plan they put their plans together in 10 year increments, which was supposed to be released in 2015, was actually not released until 2016. And it only funded the 10 year plan for 20 billion US dollars when they had requested 53 billion uh, US dollars. And so they got less than half the money that they had re requested. Um, that's a lot of that is due to the reduction in oil exports um, from Russia. A lot of it is due um, to obviously other economic conditions. The sanctions have significantly hurt the Russian space business. They launched uh, their last um, Russian GLONASS satellite in February of this year, uh, excuse me, October of last year. But that was a five year break from the prior GLONASS satellite because in that intermediary five years, we placed sanctions on them from the invasion of Crimea they could no longer get the parts for their own satellites. So they had to create an indigenous source. So those sanctions are hurting their space business uh, quite a bit. And then to make matters worse, um, the US space commercial industry has changed the dynamic in the US um, in, many, in many ways, but specifically in terms of Russia, it has created a situation where we no longer need to buy rocket engines. Um, we only, no longer need to buy um, resupply missions. We no longer need to buy manned spaceflight missions to the ISS from Russia. We are now, we can now do that all of ourselves. And that was a significant source of income uh, for the Russian program. So all of those things have, have hurt Russian spending. Diplomatically, Russia is trying to rein in U.S. efforts by uh, going ahead and aligning with um, China and other BRIC nations uh, to go to pass treaties in the UN, such as the treaties to prevent the placement of weapons in outer space and the prevention of the arms race and space treaty, which have not made any progress in the UN, but those are clearly designed to try to slow down US progress uh, in this area. And Russia is moving to closer cooperation as you articulated, Heather, in the opening statements uh, in the civil space arena. And actually my view is that represents a uh, a very dangerous um, position for us because Russia has the operational space knowledge, China has the technology and the funding. Uh, together, they can be a significant um, uh, competitor for the US. Uh, and certainly their ambition remains to be a great space power as uh, Vladimir Putin, Putin said on the anniversary of your Gagarian's um, uh, space, uh, space flight uh, just a few months ago. So this is clearly um, what we see is a Russia, Russia that started off with a very militaristic space program, um, which still has that same militaristic um, underpinnings, um, but is not supported as well financially as it was um, in the past, but is still uh, developing weapons that uh, should cause us concern. And I will stop there, um, Heather, and turn it back to you so we can have discussion on this. Well, Doug, thank you so, so much. We'll uh, have you turn off your screen so we can go back to the, to the full picture. Doug, that wasn't boring at all. You did a great job. Thank you so much. But it, it's wonderful. I'm so glad you did spend time on the history because it really does help us understand uh, from you know where Russia is moving towards. So thank you so much. All right, let me introduce the rest of this dream team who's gonna help us unpack uh, a lot of the things that Doug uh, reviewed. First, let me introduce General Robert Kaler, um, uh, retired uh, senior fellow at the National Defense University, but was the former commander of US Strategic Command from 2011 to 2013. And prior to that was the commander of the, at that time, Air Force Space Command. And so Bob, we are grateful that you are with us. And then we also have joining us uh, Victoria Sampson, who is the director in the Washington office uh, for Secure World Foundation. Uh, she has great expertise in the military space and security arena uh, and is a prolific writer and we're delighted that uh, Victoria is with us. And then finally, let me introduce my co-pilot to you, my co-moderating co-pilot, uh, Caitlin Johnson, uh, who is uh, the Deputy Director and Fellow of the CSIS Aerospace Security Project. And so Caitlin, I am so glad that you are here with me and can join this conversation. 
So Bob, let me turn to you first. Um, I would love your you know, reflections on, on Bob's uh, mini lecture. And in particular, I'd love to hear what concerns you the most. I always jokingly say, you know, we are professionally paid to, to, to focus on problems. So I'm gonna focus on the problems first and then hopefully we can talk about the diplomatic solutions, but what keeps you awake at night as you think about Russia's evolving uh, space military capabilities? Thanks, Heather, and good, good morning, afternoon, or evening to all of you, depending on what time zone you're in. I see there's a little note here in uh, chat that says that we're up to uh, about uh, 400 plus uh, participants. So I'm sure that, uh, that this is an extensive network of people that have tuned in today. And thanks for inviting me. Uh, I will try to bring the perspective of a senior military commander. Uh, and uh, I just have to say up front that these are my views. I don't represent strategic command or the Air Force or the department any longer. So this is my perspective. And uh, you ask what keeps me awake at night since the 1st of January of 2014 when I retired, it's two gray cats that keep me awake at night. Uh, most everything else uh, has, has been relegated to a different, a little bit different perspective for me. However, having said all of that, uh, I think Doug uh, laid out a really compelling uh, beginning to our conversation. And, and just let me offer a couple of thoughts about this, because in this audience, I'm sure the 400 plus people, we don't have to say much about why, why we are concerned about these things. I used to ask my staff after I would get a threat briefing or an intelligence briefing, so what? What's the so what of, of all of this? So, so let me put a little perspective on that and, and begin by just reminding everybody why space is so important and why it's important for all of us. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll get into why it's really important for the United States military, but, but let me just remind everybody, it's important for scientific discovery. It's important for economic growth and opportunity. It's important for national prestige. It's important for global safety and security. As a matter of fact, if you think about all of the ways that space is in use today uh, to protect human beings uh, on, on, the, on the planet or, or uh, in the air over the planet or on the, on the water, uh, or even <clears throat> in some cases, in really unusual places where you wouldn't think that, that space was important, but it's critically important for the entire human race these days. It's hard to convince people of that sometimes because obviously you can't see it, you can't reach out and touch it. All of the advances though, that we've seen in commercial space and the interest that, that has uh, sort of resurged across the globe, I think is helpful in this regard because it is bringing space to the forefront again. But finally, it is important for national security. Uh, the fact that, uh, that Russia can threaten US national security space assets is not new, as Doug pointed out. Uh, certainly, during the Cold War, uh, we fully expected that Russia would, would use its available weapons to try to deny US uh, space assets and, and our use of them. But there's a... a a significant difference between then and now. And the significant difference is first and most importantly in the impact of that kind of, of activity in a conflict. I would argue that in the Cold War had uh, the Soviets, like we fully expected, uh, attacked US space assets, that would not have had a decisive um, impact on the outcome of the conflict. That is not necessarily true today. Uh, today, uh, the loss of significant uh, amounts of our space assets could in fact be decisive uh, in a conflict. The United States uses its space assets uh, unlike any other space faring nation. Uh, we, we use it for um, supporting our national uh, policy makers who have unique demands of our space assets. But as a result of those assets, our policymakers know things about events uh, and adversaries that they would otherwise not know. Uh, our military commanders uh, understand more about the adversary. We can project power. We can support our allies. And of course, from a United States standpoint, we have an extensive network of allies and partners. We are a global 
power with, with those extensive allies and partnerships. And uh, our military commanders today, because of space, can see the battlefield more clearly, communicate with certainty, navigate with accuracy, strike with precision. It's basically what, what the world would call the American way of warfare. And so our adversaries, our potential adversaries, uh, or perhaps future adversaries, have watched us use our space assets certainly over the last 20 years. And uh, what they know and, and what we know is in some future conflict, uh, they cannot allow the United States to operate that way. And so the fact that, that the United States has finally acknowledged that we expect that in a future conflict, that that conflict would either begin in or, or rapidly extend into space, I think is, is um, is a long overdue policy acknowledgement that, that is borne out by the facts. What concerns me the most about what the Russians are doing, and I can get into the specifics of this uh, later, uh, isn't so much that they can threaten, it's, it's the scope and scale of what they are doing. And you have to combine that with what the Chinese are doing and, and the, the affordable and available uh, capabilities and techniques that are out there for others as well to employ. You can go to pick your favorite uh, uh, web browser and, and type in GPS jammers. And, uh, and it doesn't take you long to see that, uh, that jamming uh, of GPS, for example, those things are widely available. They're affordable. Some you can plug into the, into the uh, outputs of your car, almost said cigarette lighter. Well, that's, that's old think, but but you can plug that into, uh, into your 12 volt uh, connection in the car uh, and, and get local GPS jamming. So I think that um, it's scope and scale that concerns me. It's the aggressive, uh, maybe that's a bad word, the ambitious way that the Russians and certainly the Chinese as well are pursuing this. The fact that they have put their heads together, although that's never in the past been a marriage that's, that's um, certainly made in heaven. Uh, I think that those two partners have always uh, struggled a little bit to be partners, but I think that uh, we cannot ignore what's happening here. And certainly given the relevance and the importance of how we use space, I think that uh, for us to ignore this uh, would be uh, a, a terrible uh, policy conclusion that we would draw. And I think uh, it would be certainly wishful thinking on our part uh, as, as a mentor of mine uh, has always said, and, and, and also a former commander of strategic command, General Larry Welch retired uh, as, as often said, uh, you've got to look at an adversary's capabilities as well as their intent. Intent can change quickly, capabilities cannot. And so when you look at the Russian capabilities, I think that uh, it's impressive, uh, it's growing. Uh, at where they have struggled to make investment, they have still made investment uh, in some of these capabilities. And as Doug rightfully pointed out, uh, we, we cannot ignore this. So let me stop there and, and I'll look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you so much. And I think it's so important to hi highlight the electronic warfare element that really our comparative advantage is our great uh, capacity to see uh, the battlefield. And if that's taken away, uh, that we don't have GPS, that that really is a, a very decisive uh, issue. So thank you for raising that. Victoria, let me turn to you and ask you what keeps you up at night when you look at Russia's space capabilities, or maybe you're sleeping like a baby and nothing is concerning you. So help, help us understand your concerns. I think it's somewhere in between. Um, thank you, Heather, for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation so far. Looking forward to the rest of it. I mean, a couple of things really struck me out of Doug's presentation. Um, first off, sorry, I think it's using my earbuds. Um, first off, that you know, I think the point he made about the nature of the competition having change is an important one. Um, we tend in the United States to think of uh, the early part of the Cold War as a race to the moon, frankly, because we got there first. It's convenient. And we can say, cha-ching, we won that one. Uh, but when actuality, you know, it was a military competition and there were parts of it that we were not the first ones to do. Um, second of all, um, the part that really struck me as well is that there's just not really, I feel like there is um, a struggle for a raison d'etre for the Russian space program at this point. Um, Doug talked about um, their commercial sector, how they tried to shift and pivot towards that during the Cold War um, when that ended. 
but it, they've had not had a lot of success. There's not really a strong Russian commercial military space sector, um, sorry, com commercial space sector at this point. Um, and that has always been a concern for the Russians. You know, during the negotiations for the Outer Space Treaty in the 1960s, the Soviet diplomats tried to argue that there was no such thing as non-state actors in space and that, you know, commercial actors had no business being in space and it should just be nation states. And the United States obviously felt very differently. The compromise was to have Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty, which requires nations to um, provide continuing supervision for activities of their citizens in space. And so that was the point that allowed commercial sector to um, have their top, to have their um, <clears throat> position in space. But that still didn't mean the Russians actually developed it. And now we're going to a point where the commercial sector is becoming not just a major part of space, but the dominant part of space. Right now, there's probably roughly, depending, you know, it changes all the time, but roughly 4,600 active satellites on orbit. And if you look at all the satellites that the um, mega constellation operators are looking to launch, um, there could be up over 120,000 more within the decade or so. And obviously, those aren't all going to come to fruition, but a large part of them are. And um, we've already seen in the past year or so, 1,500 satellites added by one operator, um, SpaceX, with their Starlink. And so space is shifting from a domain that has been primarily one dominated by nation states, and frankly, one that the Russians were major actors in, to one that will be almost entirely, in terms of numbers, the commercial sector. And Russia does not have a role to play in that. Um, and so I think what, I, what worries me when I'm looking at the Russian space program is that I feel like they're looking at, okay, what is their comparative advantage here? It's not gonna be commercial space. Um, civil space to a certain extent, but as been pointed out there, as Doug mentioned, the, the budget's not really there, or at least not as much as it used to be. What does that lead them? The military space sector. And as both um, General Kaler and Doug brought up, you know, there have been a lot of activities being done to develop their counter space capabilities. So I think really that's where we need to keep an eye on things to make sure that you know, we don't have an inadvertent escalation um, based on Russia trying to reach earlier glory in its current capabilities for space. Victoria, thank you so much. I think you're, you're really highlighting an important point about in some ways because of uh, their lack of commercial de development, their military satellites has outsized an outsized role, but it's actually performing a commercial function in some strange ways. So to make sure we really are understanding their perspective. So thank you so much. Caitlin, let me turn this over to you for the next round of questions. We want to bring Doug into this conversation. We let him rest after the lecture. Now we got to bring him in here. So over to you, Caitlin. Sure. Thanks, Heather, for having me. Um, hello, everybody. And hello, Doug, Victoria, and General Kaler. It's so great to be here with you guys. Um, I want to continue this conversation that we've, we've started the ball rolling, talking about Russian military space capabilities. In the United States, we hear a lot about investing in um, proliferated LEO, as Victoria brought up, um, so large constellations in low Earth orbit, um, or reusable launch like SpaceX. What military capabilities do we know the Russians are investing in, or where do you see some gaps that we can kind of hedge our bets? And then similarly, um, you know, very directed at, at Victoria and her, her work in global counter space, um, where are Russia's investments in, in uh, space weapons? Yeah, um, uh, Caitlin, uh, thank you uh, for that. So, you know, I, I think it's uh, to answer the first part of your question, what are the Russians investing in military space? And let me let me leave to the side for a moment the anti-satellite activities and talk about the kinds of activities they're doing elsewhere. As Victoria pointed out, there's really not a commercial space industry that's, that's happening uh, in Russia. It is military space. That Russian military space plan that I talked about that was passed in 2016 actually approved 32 new satellites. Now, that's a large number of satellites, but it's fewer than um, Elon Musk launches in one launch on a Starlink uh, on a Starlink launch. So, to put it in perspective, but those 32 satellites are 13 communication satellites, some number of um, GLONASS satellites, um, an increased um, capability, electronic monitoring and imaging satellites, uh, and missile warning satellites. Typically, are the things they uh, are approving, plus some planetary probes, and the Russians are still. Uh, focused, you know, they still celebrate as 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 uh, Victoria um, suggested. Um, we we set the moon as the goal, and then and then congratulated ourselves when we got there first. We forget that Russia got to Venus first, um, and they still and they still um, 
remind themselves of that uh, all the time. Um, and so there, there are some still planetary probes um, that Russia is doing as well. But, but you know, I, I have a sense, my sense is that the biggest new investments in Russian uh, military space really are in these anti-satellite activities um, because those give them more leverage as General Kaler um, clearly pointed out those give them more leverage in a, in a future combat, uh, a future war, future conflict with the U.S. or with our allies who also use space capabilities. Um, they will get more military leverage out of denying our space capabilities than they will of exploiting their own. Russia is more regional power than a global power. China and the U.S. both are. The U.S. is currently a global power, as General Kaler said. China has ambitions to become a global power. Um, Russia is really a regional power. And if you're a regional power, space is less important to helping your military fight the war and is more important to deny your adversary the ability so they cannot project power into your region. And so that's why we see that even in these, even in this low spending regime that we see happening in Russia, them focusing so much energy on anti-satellite activities. Yeah, Caitlin, let me just pile onto that for a second because I, I think there are really three things that, that um, I'm concerned about. First, and, and this may sound uh, a little bit off subject, but, but the first thing that concerns me about the, what the Russians are doing isn't in space at all, it's in cyberspace. And I'm very concerned about um, their capabilities in cyberspace in, in many respects. I think those capabilities are far more uh, advanced, uh, far more concerning than are their space capabilities. And so I think we have to be mindful of that. I know that uh, you know, my continued involvement on the periphery of, of the Department of Defense and the military and the, and the new Space Force and Space Command as well uh, I know that, that they are very concerned. I was concerned about that at STRATCOM. I think that all of the combatant commands are very concerned about uh, cyber, cyber vulnerabilities that, that, that come along with this wonderful networking that we can do. Uh, there are vulnerabilities that come with that as well. And so that, that's the number one thing that concerns me about what the Russians are doing. The second thing is what they're doing in space. And that's uh, less, as Doug points out, less about their improved capabilities. Although, let me say a word about that. Uh, you know, people have said that uh, insecurity begets instability. And so I've always been, and security begets stability. So I've always been uh, supportive of things that the Russians do in space that help them feel more secure. So for example, missile warning. For example, I, I, I'm very, I'm very pleased when when the Russians uh, put put more missile warning kinds of things on orbit that they can trust what it is that that uh, they are sensing and seeing around the world, so that there's clarity of understanding on their part about whether they're being threatened by something. And I think that's that to me. I, I welcome that. I support that. Uh, but there are some other things that they're doing to improve their own military capabilities that, of course, are concerning. But I agree with Doug. It's, that's less concerning to me than their counter space things that they can do uh, actually in space these days. So I'm very concerned about, uh, second here, about what they are doing in space. And the third thing that I'm concerned about is what they can do from the ground. And that is jamming and anti-satellite uh, activities, uh, surveillance, their, their space surveillance network, I think, uh, has become more sophisticated. And uh, so uh, as, as more and more and more objects go to space, I think the global awareness of, of space is going to increase. I think that presents some difficulties for us. Those are not uh, difficulties we, we, uh, we can't overcome. But I think that uh, you know this notion in the past that we could hold the uh, uh, things close to our vest and wouldn't be seen and this and that. I think that that that's uh, that's no longer going to be the way we can operate in space and and think that somehow we are getting an advantage with that. So those are the three things that concern me the most about what they're doing. Uh, and uh, let's please let's not take our eye off cyberspace. Great. Um, well, coming in third, um, a lot of what I was going to say has been covered, but I would like to point out a couple of different Russian capabilities for space that have not been mentioned yet. 
Um, one, and then both of which they're really good at. Um, one is their position, position navigation and timing um, system, their GLONASS system, their version of GPS, um, which is a probably second to the United States um, internationally. Um, and that's something that they've been trying to promote more in terms of um, you know, users using instead of GPS receivers. Um, the second one is their space situational awareness um, system. Their network is very strong. Again, second probably just to the United States. Um, but allows them to have um, views of space that, um, you know, it's a different catalog than what the U.S. military has and um, either could be complementary to it or, you know, against it, depending on how you look at it. But it definitely is a capability that they have. Um, and then in terms of their counter space capabilities, a lot of that has been touched on already. But it does appear that within the past decade or so, the Russians have been trying to reinvigorate their counter space capabilities that they had developed during the Cold War and possibly let lay dormant or you know, not pay as much attention to. And these are things, and specifically, I think their stronger parts um, are the rendezvous and proximity operations, both in low Earth orbit and geostationary orbit. Uh, has been mentioned before that there has been some non-consensual approaches to other countries' satellites. That is extremely discomforting um, for the, the owners of the satellites. So that's been a concern as well. Um, it looks like there's been a reinvigoration of the direct descent ASAT anti-satellite weapon system. Again, um, this is building up on Cold War capabilities and then you know expanding from there. Um, and then it's been mentioned as well their early their electronic warfare, you know, GPS jamming in the eastern Ukraine. Um, has been a primary part of that conflict. And I'd like to make a point um, that Secure World makes in their counter space threat assessment and CSIS does as well in their excellent counter space threat assessment. When we're talking counter space capabilities, there are no places where you have um, kinetic or destructive counter space capabilities being used in active military conflicts. However, you do have non destructive counter space capabilities being used in conflicts. And again, Russia's early warning. Um, I'm sorry, Russia's electronic warfare um, jamming capabilities are absolutely being used in military conflicts. Um, so just to you know, emphasize again, I think oftentimes when we talk counter space, we tend to focus on things that blow up because that's a great visual and it's easy to understand. But there are counter space capabilities, cyber jamming being done right now. And that are just probably just as concerning because really when it comes down to it, it's not necessarily, you know, the, I think the concern you have is that there's an interference with your ability to get information from space. If that interference is there, then that's a concern, I think, for planners as well. Thank you. Well, Victoria, thank you so much and, and for really highlighting that because it's a great lead into to my next question as well as I'm going to bring in, uh, we've got a great question from our audience and just to a shout out to our viewers, please send us your questions or comments we want to bring you uh, into this conversation. I was going to very specifically ask how do you see uh, Russia's use of space-based assets in their recent, uh, in conflictual situations in Syria, in Ukraine in particular? And I think I hear across the board, you're all highlighting this electronic warfare. And I, I do appreciate, you know, it, it's one thing to show the tank being blown up, but if you cannot operate, <laughs> if you cannot know where your positioning is, if you don't have eyes and ears into the, the battle space, you really, really are, are limited. So I would welcome uh, uh, reflections from, from the panel. And then uh, our audience asked, looking ahead, what could be considered a game changer uh, in terms of critical space capabilities? Is there a, a, an element of R&D you're focusing on or technological innovation that you think may we may need to, to pay attention to? Uh, Doug, I'll, I'll use that 1946 uh, RAND study and go, what's your crystal ball uh, for 2021? So two-part question, we'll, we'll keep that order. We'll, we'll go Doug and Bob and Victoria. So what are you watching actual real time what Russia is doing, maybe Syria, Ukraine, add anything more to Victoria's comments? And then is there the game changer? What, what should we be looking for? Sure. Um, so Heather, you know, I, I, so number one, I certainly do not have access to everything that the Russians used in Syria. And sometimes it's hard for us to, to tell. It's clear, for example, uh, that Russia made great use of SATCOM in Syria. Um, it is clear that they used PNT capabilities. It's not clear whether or not the PNT capabilities they used were GPS or GLONASS, um, uh, but it's uh, probably a mixture of the two. They have been trying to wean themselves uh, from GPS, um, which has historically been more reliable. Uh, than GLONASS, um, but they uh, but they certainly use a combination of the two, and clearly they used imaging 
uh, capabilities um, to go ahead and support their military operations in Syria. But what we also saw in Syria, and you know, Victor Victoria already mentioned jamming that we've seen in Ukraine and in the, some of the um, exercises the U.S. has done, NATO exercises in the North Sea. But we saw active jamming uh, going on in uh, in Syria, we actually don't know the source of the jamming. We don't know if, if it was uh, being done from equipment that uh, Russia brought to Syria or whether it was being done from uh, Russian mainlands, but we saw jamming of US uh, SATCOM capabilities specifically um, in Syria that, uh, that uh, certainly was used in several areas. Um, again, we can't characterize who exactly used it, where they were where they were um, uh, coming from, or at least I do not know that information. We may we may know that elsewhere within the U.S. government. Um, so, so those those things we see them actively using it, and and this, by the way, is something that concerns me because this is all experience. This builds experience in the use of counter space capabilities. Um, it's one thing to have a technical capability. It's a second thing to be, actually have the operational experience of using them in war, and so. I view these activities very much as practice rounds for um, for Russia in the same way. And I think we see the same thing in the cyber realm in which I couldn't agree more uh, with uh, General Kayla on cyber. Um, in fact, it's that combination of space and cyber that has me so worried because space is, space is particularly susceptible to cyber um, as a mechanism to go ahead and eliminate capability. Um, and the reason we've spent billions of dollars trying to shore that up, but we still will never know if the walls are high enough and thick enough to prevent those kind of cyber attacks. So now what do I see as a game changer? And I think what you mean by that is the game changer on the US side. What does the US, what does the US do? Well, I've been preaching that gospel for um, at least the last uh, seven years um, in terms of resilience, resilience, and resilience. Um, uh, you know, there's there's certainly a debate, and it's a valid debate that goes on within the U.S. Um, about what's the right balance of how do we defend our space capabilities? Um, do we do that with active defense, uh, something that people might call space superiority, or do we do that uh, with passive defense, such as resilience? Um, and resilience in this manner means things like proliferation and distribution and all sorts of things. Uh, we wrote a paper on that that I, the audience can grab off the internet at some point if they'd like. Um, I find that resilience is the key. And the lucky thing is, is that the commercial world and our own space industry, and I don't want to go ahead and, and, and not um, go ahead and give a nod to both sides of our space industry, the more defense focused side of our space industry and the commercial side of our space industry are both providing the wherewithal uh, to go ahead and create the resilience we need in our space systems and our allies are as well. Um, and so these things, that is where I see the hope. I, I see the changing of our capabilities to ones that are inherently resilient, inherently less, more secure, inherently less able to be attacked. And that's a whole separate lecture that we would have to go through to, to explain that. Um, that is the key for how we maintain our capability in military space, in my opinion. Thanks, Doug. And, and General Kaler, I may ask you not only US game-changing capabilities, but maybe Russian capabilities as well, if you have some reflections on that. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, so let's talk for a second. And like Doug, uh, you know, when you're retired, uh, you're, you're mostly relegated to open source information. And so, uh, so let me just sort of rely on what we all have seen from open sources. Uh, and, and let me say that that uh, let, me, let me use an analogy. The Olympic games are coming up. So let me use an analogy from the Olympic games. In diving, uh, scores are based on a couple of things, the execution of the dive, but there's also a degree of difficulty associated with a dive. I would tell you that there's a degree of difficulty associated with military operations as well. And uh, back in 1992, following the first Gulf War, the Russian military began writing about what they called the reconnaissance strike complex. They observed what it was uh, the United States and, and coalition forces did in terms of precision strike. And, and they, the Russians, wrote pretty extensively about this, this ability to sense and see and decide and act in almost real time and enabling precision weapon delivery. And so I think what I have taken away from Russian operations 
is this notion of, of um, sophisticated, integrated operations. And to me, that's the game changer. Uh, and, and you can plug in your various capabilities as they evolve into that. But if you can't link sensors, shooters, and command and control in an operationally relevant way anymore, it almost, you know, you're, you're wasting your capabilities. And so on both sides of this conversation, senior military people, certainly U.S. senior military people, when they go testify in front of Congress, uh, continue to stress the need to be able to do integrated operations. That's integrated across the combatant commands. That's integrated among the capabilities. And each of the services has a little bit different way that they talk about it. But being able to take and, and see and decide and act faster than, than the adversary is going to be the single most important game changer. Uh, and there's almost a race underway between the potential adversaries here to see who kind of gets there first. And uh, it, it, it will, it's powerful, it, it is uh, essential. And uh, again, anymore, the speed of operations today uh, and, and as we introduce things like artificial intelligence and, and as we introduce sort of ubiquitous sensing uh, that, that will come from commercial sources and other things. Uh, the fact that uh, we have the greatest airplane or the best ship or the most effective tank uh, is only a piece of the conversation. So while I agree about space having to be resilient, I think that's a fundamental, that's foundationally important. Uh, and and, and uh, we can't spend too much time on that. I agree with Doug completely in that regard. To me, the game changer here on both sides and what's most concerning about what we've seen the Russians do uh, is this notion of integrated operations. Victoria. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, and this maybe this speaks to my lack of imagination, it's not necessarily going to be some sort of technological leap by the Russians, but um, building off what General Killer said, it's going to be the activities of actions. Um, and very specifically, in the past 10, 15 years or so, We've had the Chinese do um, a deliberate creation of debris with an anti-satellite test in 2007. You had the United States shoot down um, one of our own satellites that was failing. And um, you know, there was some debris created with that in 2008. You had the Indians do shoot down one of their satellites and a direct SNA test in 2019 created debris, um, deliberate creation of debris. And so for me, I think if the Russians were to deliberately shoot down one of their own satellites, the direct SNA sat and create debris, I think that would, um, be very provocative um, and it would cause a lot of consternation and would really, I think, spur discussions about how to respond to that. And so for a lot of what space, active, um, space discussions, the technology obviously is a key part of it, but really it's the behavior and the activities that really determine you know, what's, how it's gonna be perceived. And I think that would, that sort of change in behavior um, would accelerate a lot of the concerns that the United States has in terms of Russian's counter space capabilities. Thanks so much, Victoria. Caitlin, let me turn it over to you for our last round of questions for our panel. Sure, thanks all. Um, Heather kind of mentioned this in the beginning, but we've seen uh, increasing media and news reports and cooperation between China and Russia. Of course, in 2008, they jointly submitted the PPWT, a, a UN resolution to limit space weapons. But since then, we've seen other areas of cooperation, including on the Chinese space station, as well as a potential for a lunar base. So maybe we'll go in the opposite direction and start with Victoria, but we'd love to just hear your comments on what that partnership is like and you know how worried should we be, how much should we be tracking you know, what their uh, space cooperation looks like. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting because it, it seems like there is um, the possibility for two different camps, two different ways of thinking in terms of how we evolve our use of space specifically as more countries go back or get to the moon or as the United States goes back to the moon. Um, the United States has its Artemis Accords, which are basically principles pulled out of the Outer Space Treaty and saying, okay, you know, as we look at lunar governance and look at um, using space resources, these are the principles and actions that we want to see guiding our behavior. And the United States uh, has invited other countries to sign on. And we've got, uh, you know, a, a lot of interest in, I think, 19 countries have signed on at this point. 
but very noticeably not China, not Russia. And so um, with China and Russia establishing, you know, their, their MOU for, you know, lunar cooperation and then saying, okay, we're going to do a moon base. I mean, a lot depends on what actually happens. The devil's always in the details, but I think it's an interesting counter to what the U.S. does. And of course, in theory, and they've, they've also encouraged um, other countries to join them in their work. And I know the European Space Agency, for example, has expressed some interest. And so in theory, these are not competitive activities. In theory, one could be an Artemis Accord signator and also work with Russians and Chinese on their, their moon capabilities. In theory, I don't know if that's actually gonna happen. Um, and so I, I, that concerns me. I'd love to see at a point where you know, we don't necessarily have to be in lockstep, but at least have, you know, a common understanding of what is considered responsible behavior and sustainable behavior as we move on to this next use of space and to make the major space actors, I think it'd be very helpful, but I think it's going to take proactive moves, um, leadership on both sides to have happen. Otherwise, I think we have a situation where we accidentally devolve into two um, different camps in terms of activities and behavior in the moon. General Kaler, your thoughts? I think it remains to be seen what that partnership really does. Uh, I, uh, again, as I look back over my time in uniform and, and other times I think shaped primarily during the Cold War uh, from my perspective, when Russia and China said that they were working together, they were going to cooperate on things, um, I, they, they have never seemed to me to be natural partners. I think they have, they force that. Uh, and, and so I don't know if it's going to result in, in anything that's meaningful here. I, I guess you could say the same thing about Russia and the United States and the International Space Station, but that was an enduring partnership that really, really was quite successful, I think, even through the ups and downs of the politics involved in all of this. And so I think um, certainly we have to be mindful of that. Certainly, I think we have to acknowledge that at least in the near term, this competition between the major spacefaring nations is not gonna go away. And, and I think we've gotta be engaged in that competition. Now, having said that, even if we were all politically good friends, I think industrially there would be competition here. Uh, and so I think we just need to understand that competition at some level is gonna be part of how the world goes forward here in space but I would prefer to see a couple of things happen uh, sooner rather than later. And one of those is, I think it is to everyone's benefit to establish some kind of, call it what you want, rules of the road, principles of behavior, those kind of things. I am not a fan of trying to go down the arms control road at this point related to space. I think it's, that's too difficult. And I think that it, it, um, it, it would be frustrating and, and uh, I'm not sure it, would, it benefits uh, the United States uh, as, as much as it might benefit uh, the Russians or the Chinese or both of them. So, uh, but I do think that, that we at least have to have some international agreements about behavior. Uh, I used to say this in testimony and I, I would get the question, uh, you know, I would use the analogy about speed limits on highways. And people would say, I would say, you got to have speed limits. And people would say, well, it doesn't stop speeding. And my retort to that is no, but it tells you who the speeders are. And, and that to me is the issue here is, is you want to say what's good and what's bad behavior here so that you know who's behaving badly. And, and there's some recourse to go back to them and say, uh, please, please don't do this. Or there's, there's some other uh, restrictions. The, the policy and legal framework that we have today for space is, um, is certainly a start, but it is, it is woefully inadequate for where we find ourselves in space today. And, uh, and to me, one of the first uh, orders of business needs to be uh, a continuation uh, of, of this conversation to lead to some kind of agreements about what's acceptable behavior and what's not. And Russia is notoriously good at testing what good and bad behavior is on orbit. 
Doug, the last couple minutes are, are for you. Take yeah, us boy, home. Boy, sure. My clock says I have less than 30 seconds here, uh, Caitlin. So, um, um, but, uh, so, I, and I, and, and quickly, um, let me, let me go back to your original question on this. Um, so let me presuppose um, that uh, China and Russia are able to surmount their previous difficulties of partnership. And, and I'm in a full agreement with General Kahlo that has that never worked out for them in the past. But let's presuppose that um, that, that, that does work out in the future, that there, that, that has happened. I find that particularly troubling. Um, and here's why. Um, as I said it during, uh, during the briefing, Russia has the operational experience um, to go ahead and understand what they can do from space, how to integrate it into their military operations, um, how they do manned space flight, how they do um, uh, clearly military activities, how they test anti-satellite activities. Russia has experience on deception in space. Russia has experience that is incredibly valuable to a technologically advanced but operationally inexperienced China. Um, and and I have a my fear in space is not so much from Russia; it's more from China, uh, quite frankly. Uh, my fear from Russia is more cyber focused. My fear from China is more space focused. Um, and I think the combination of those two um, could be very dangerous um, if that's the direction they wanted to take it in. Um, I'm in full agreement with uh, General Kaler and Victoria on the need for. Uh, rules of the road. I actually um, have worked, I've gone over and lectured at the UN several times uh, on this topic. So it certainly is something that uh, that I believe is critically important. But my concern is the combination of these two is greater than either individually. And, and that worries me if they can surmount those historical differences we've always seen. Well, thank you so much. For me, the three takeaways from this conversation you know, in part, Russia's um, uh, space-based military capabilities may be more about denying the U.S. Uh, and, and its extensive capabilities than actually exploiting its own resources. This cross-domain dimension of cyber and space, we so silo these activities. How do we integrate them? Because we see that Russia is integrating them. And as you noted, the third element, practicing, they are practicing uh, in real time, how this works, and they are developing experience. And I think, I think you all have really highlighted there must there must be much more study in understanding the Sino-Russia partnership because exactly, Doug, you're right. They bring different things to the table, but combined, uh, they can certainly be formidable. But we hope uh, we can start a better diplomatic track. Victoria mentioned space debris. There's a lot of things we need to do to give greater transparency and confidence building measures. Well, uh, General uh, Kaler, you started it in the spirit of the upcoming Summer Olympics, Go Team USA. I think if our panelists were on the diving platform, because we did such a deep dive into Russia's space capabilities, they'd all receive a 10, Caitlin too. So we are very grateful to you for just providing really great insights. Again, thanks to uh, U.S. European Command and the Russia Strategic Initiative for helping us understand Russia's evolving space uh, military capabilities. Until then, thank you to our audience. We look forward to uh, future upcoming events on the Russia Military Capabilities Working Group. Until then, thank you. Be safe. Be well. We'll see you soon. Take care.